All right, welcome everyone. Jeff, if you can, would you please read the mission statement and then sure. I will introduce uh, Mike. Okay, Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religion, religious or non-religious background, and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at the Helping Parents Heal meeting is voluntary, and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It's understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from these presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm going to introduce Mike, and then I will turn the meeting over to him. I'm going to read his bio. Mike Edwards' bio. Mike's son and only child, Dylan, passed due to a heroin overdose on November 28, 2016, shortly after his 24th birthday, and just before reaching six months of continuous sobriety. After attending several grief meetings for parents, Mike saw the obvious lack of participation by fathers. In March 2019, he started Helping Fathers Heal, an affiliate group of Helping Parents Heal. The closed group provides a confidential, safe place for men to share their challenges and successes in dealing with devastating child loss. In this breakout session, Mike will share his story, including examples of afterlife evidence from Dylan since his passing, and how these signs have changed the trajectory of Mike's life path and helped him to find acceptance, humility, serenity, and hope. Helping Fathers Heal is a closed group for men that provide a secure private environment for fathers to share their struggles, challenges, and successes in dealing with the loss of a child. And we thank Mike for starting this group. So thank you, welcome Mike. If you have any questions for Mike, please put them in the chat box. Um, they will be reviewed and you can ask your questions uh, later in the presentation. Thanks, Irene, appreciate it. <clears throat> so yeah, we were, I was thinking about how to manage tonight's content. And what I'd probably like to do is start off just by giving you the story about how we started the group, because it's, it's actually a pretty interesting story. And then um, I've invited uh, <clears throat> Chris and Andy and Warren and, and there's some others, Jeff are here. So, um, you know, if they want to chime in too, I, I don't want to make it really formal tonight. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so the way we started the group, so <clears throat> like Irene said, you know, our son Dylan was 24 when he passed uh, November 28th, 2016. 2016 and he had been um pretty much hooked on heroin <clears throat> for about five years after a motorcycle wreck he had a motorcycle wreck and they put him on opioids and um, once his leg healed they cut him off and unfortunately he got my genes and so he's uh, he had an addict uh, disposition addictive you know personality, that sort of thing. And, <clears throat> and so he ended up doing going into heroin and, and that so that was a long, really long struggle. Um, but he on his in his third time in rehab, he finally got clean. And he got clean for six, like six whole months. And um, we were so blessed to have our son back, you know, like, the real Dylan's personality was back. The sense of humor and all that kind of stuff. He was kind of warped like me. So um, <clears throat> anyway, 
once he passed, uh, Allison and I, you know, went and I won't name groups or whatever, but we went to some, some grief meetings in, in uh, so he passed in November. I think the first time we went was February. It was once a month and we'd go in, there was a huge crowd. It was like 40, 50 people. And, but I'd look around the room and I'd go, man, there's like five guys here, you know, out of 50. And then I'd start sort of asking the, the ladies, I said, you know, are you married? Like, where's your spouse? Oh, no, no. He don't want to talk about it. He don't want, he don't want to, he don't even want to go there. He don't want to talk about it. And so I started thinking about it and I said, you know, like, well, why is that? You know? And, but you know, the obvious answer was, I mean, I mean, it's complex, but it has a lot to do with being in a mixed, a mixed crowd, a mixed setting because of the way, you know, men are raised and, the way we're wired and uh so <clears throat> anyway so that was 2017 and being a right a right brain thinker i'm a geophysicist and uh so what i did was i did what's called intellectualized grief and what that means is you know instead of instead of crying i started reading books and i read books about grief and I got through about three or four of those, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and, you know, those sorts of things. But I got really bored with that pretty fast because, because my goal was really, I, I wanted to know that our son Dylan was okay. I just wanted to know that he was okay. And I didn't want to go, I didn't want to go based on, um, and, I've got a, I, you know, my parents are from the Bible Belt, so this isn't a slam on church or anything, but I didn't want to go based on, you know, something somebody else had told me. Yeah, I wanted to know it. You know, I wanted what I call my truth. Yeah. And so I started intellectualizing grief. I started doing research on afterlife and I went into, I, I, I was reading books about, um, you know, mediumship and near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences. And I mean, you just name it, you know, I, mean, I read all of it. And I don't remember how, but somehow it got me to helping parents heal. And so Allison and I went to the first conference uh, in April of 2018. And I always describe it as it's the first grief thing that we ever went to where we left feeling better than we than when we went in. And I know that the, the announcement just came out too. This isn't a, it's not a marketing or a sales pitch, but um, the next one is next year, was it August, Irene? And you know, man, if you can make it, you, you should really go for it because it's, it was, it was fantastic. So anyway, we went to the first one in 2018 <clears throat> and we met a lot of mediums and that sort of thing. And then I don't remember exactly when, but my wife, Allison and I sat in on a, a, a group Zoom like this one with a lady called Kat Bailey over in the UK. And anyway, Kat <clears throat> sort of, she picked us out of the group and she nailed all these specific things that nobody ever, nobody could have known. I mean, irrefutable evidence. Okay. And <clears throat> about a month or two before that, I had, I had, I was, I had begun building a website for men, for men's grief, men only grief. And so after that reading, um, you know, I, I went to Kat and I said, you know, wow, that was fantastic, you know, and I just wanted to share, you know, this idea that I've got with you and, you know, think, see what you think about it. I'm building this website for men only because I see this need, you know, and uh, she said, well, yeah, that's really cool. But you know what? Helping Parents Heal, I think, has identified the need for the same thing. So you might want to go to them. Well, I met Elizabeth and Irene and all these people um, at, at that conference. 
And so I went to him and I, and I went, man, there's no sense to no sense in reinventing the wheel. Right. I mean, they already have the tools. They already have the Facebook stuff and and all that. So anyway, we cranked it up in March of uh, yeah, 2019. And it was like March 30th of, of 2019. And we started off with five members. And right now we're, um, these aren't all Facebook people, but we're about to hit 400 in 13 different countries. So I think it was right. You know, there was a need for this. And, you know, the meetings now, instead of five guys showing up, uh, we have weekly meetings every Wednesday night, um, you know, four times a month. This is my little dog. <laughs> hey. And <clears throat> so now instead of five, instead of five guys showing up every week, we end up with, I don't know, 20 to 30, you know, and on a good week, we have more. So um, it's pretty good. But that um, that synergy or whatever, you know, that that sort of pushed me to help them parents heal, I thought was pretty interesting. And and the connection, I mean, I didn't have to reach out to Kat, right? So uh, it was a it was a pretty cool story. As far as uh, so that's about it for that. But uh, as far as the differences between the way men and women grieve, um, I mean, everybody knows it's pretty obvious that, and, and, you know, and I'm going to talk in real generalistic terms, okay, I don't, you know, which I don't really like to do. Everybody's not the same. But in general, from from my experiences with the guys over the last couple of years, um, a lot, most of them are like me. And so what I'd like to do just real quick is use myself as an example. And, uh, you know, I came up from a family, you know, I had a, a disciplinary dad. He was a drill instructor in the Air Force when I was born and, and that kind of stuff. Never showed emotions. And, you know, he was the stoic type. And so that was my role model. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think, I, think, I think most people already know that, you know, the major differences between men and women uh, generally as far as emotions and, and non-emotions, right? Um, and a lot of it has to do with that. But the fact that, that we're sort of raised in this stoic manner, you know, sort of having to be there for the family, having to be there, having to be in charge and having to uh, be in control and, and all that kind of stuff. When, you know, when I lost, when I lost our son and he was our only, our only child, it's like, you know, that, that whole game plan changed, you know, and, uh, I've learned a lot since then, even though it's only been almost five years, I've learned a whole lot, a whole lot. And, um, and my, my life trajectory when that happened has completely changed completely changed. So um, I have so much more empathy now, for example. And, uh, and I can actually sit with this group of 30 men on a Zoom meeting and, and tell them I love them. I never, if anybody ever knew me before, they would, they would just be laughing. They'd be, oh, come on, man. That's not Mike, right? But but now I say it and I mean it. That's the difference. I mean, it's so cool. It's really, really cool. It, I'm just, that's, you know, that's just one example of, of how my life has changed. And, uh, you know, we're not happy about Dylan, you know, his passing and stuff. But what I can say, uh, you know, without doubt is that, you know, we don't die. Our bodies die. And we've had irrefutable evidence from Dylan that I, I promise you, and if it's, if it's that way for us, it's got to be that way for everyone else. I mean, he, you know, he's not, he's not by himself, put it that way. 
Yeah. And we have had irrefutable evidence that nobody ever could have, uh, could have come up with. So, you know, the fact, you know, that was, that was the game changer for Allison and I, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was just wanting to know that he was okay. I didn't have to know the, the details or the specifics about where he was or any of that. I just wanted to know that he wasn't just, you know, gone. And uh, once we started getting that evidence, it was like amazing, amazing, the, the weight that was off our shoulders. And, you know, we were still grieving and, and you know, even almost five years, I mean, we're still grieving, you know, I still think about him every day but I know he's okay. And that's a game changer. That's a real game changer, you know? So, and then a lot of people ask me too, uh, some of the dads asked me like, so when did things change for you? And so that's, that's the first thing was just finding out that Dylan was okay and really believing it and really knowing it and not being a desperate father you know, like grasping, you know, for anything, you know, uh, it was, it was, it was about two and a half years, I guess, into it. And uh, by then I had settled down a little bit. And, but once I got, once I knew that in my heart, uh, that was, that was a big lift. The second thing that was a game changer for me was being of service. And I used to be a manager. Um, I won't get into all that, but anyway, I was a manager and <clears throat> decision maker, geophysicist, right brain, all that kind of stuff, right? And so that was my world. But, um, you know, once he passed, it was like a change for me that I needed to be of service. And I think that had a big, it, it may have been Dylan, like, you know, like poking me, you know, saying be of service, you know, I don't know. I don't know what happened, but, but it's like, it's like, like Irene was saying, my, the trajectory, the trajectory of my life completely changed. And I think that was a really huge factor in starting up helping fathers heal. So I don't want to just ramble on. Um, I actually invited some people, um, Andy and Chris, and, and we've got some dads here. So if, if you guys, like I said, I want to keep it informal tonight, you know, not make it one of these, uh, I, you don't want to listen to me for an hour. Trust me. So, um, yeah, Andy's like, yeah, yeah, we don't want it. <laughs> so, and Jeff too. Yeah. So uh, if, if one of you guys want to jump in and talk about maybe differences in how men and women grieve, that'd be good. I'll jump in if you guys don't mind. Sure, yeah. go ahead, Andy. Thanks, Andy. You got it. Uh, obviously, Andy Bohart, my son, uh, transitioned. Uh, we're two days away from two years ago. Uh, single car accident. Um, Obviously, I won't go into the whole how my life has changed. We'll just all admit that our lives are completely different than they used to be. Um, let me talk about, hold on, sounds like my dog is getting disciplined in the other room. Uh, um, the question was, um, dads talk about how they felt early on, how they had to be strong for their wives. And I know women talk about wishing that uh, their spouses would be more open and vulnerable. Um, so I'm military background, was a Marine, um, very, very typical man. Um, for In my case, I won't talk for all men, but in my case, uh, it was all about being strong, standing up for my family. I come from um, a blended family, so, I've kind of got two families. I've got Josh's birth mom and my uh, my our youngest son, and then and a, then my stepson. So I've got two families that I had to be strong for. 
when Josh passed, I was on the other side of the planet. I was in London, um, got the phone call that nobody ever wants to get. Um, and I came back to this, what we all know, this crater of what used to be our normal. Um, and I felt, I felt a lot of different things. The other dads can talk to them as well, but my feelings were utter dev devastation, having no idea what to do, how to do it, when to do it. Um, but then that responsibility of having to be strong for my two other sons and for my wife and for Josh's mom, um, even having to be strong for my parents, which sounds weird, but I had to, I had to bring them out so they could go to Josh's, um, oh, why am I getting feedback, uh, to Josh's viewing and uh, services. So there was a lot of responsibility and I was absolutely crushed and I was numb. I didn't know what to do. Like I said, I'm getting a lot of feedback here. I'll just keep going. Um, what I learned very quickly is that strength had absolutely nothing to do with it. It's not really helpful that it is critical for, it was critical for me to be weak and be vulnerable and be open. Um, I was broken open, so I had no other option. It was the most honest way to honor my son. And that really early on, I understood that standing tall in the storm, which is, I've used that in the men's group a couple of times, was the most honest way to honor my son. Being fake and strong and trying to be something that I really wasn't anymore was not honoring what I termed at that point, his sacrifice. Um, so, I mean, that's how, that's how I dealt with it. Um, we, in our group, you see that a lot. You see first dads, you know, trying to be strong and trying to hold up their family. And we've had plenty of dads talk about that very thing. And I think the other dads can speak to it, but I think that's the strength of our group helping fathers heal is that while we're still sort of responsible for being strength in our family, we need a place to break down. We need a place to let it, let all our cards on the table and be able to speak freely and helping fathers heal does that. Uh, and there are dads that talk a lot and there are dads that don't say a word. And, but we all show up week after week after week um, to share our experiences and to be there for each other. And it is a brotherhood. Um, so if you have any men in your lives that need to hang out with us and vent, please, Wednesday night. All right. I guess I'll go next. <clears throat> I'm Chris Myers. Uh, hey, Chris. My daughter Paige um, passed in 2017, August. So we just came through a uh, fourth anniversary of that. And uh, she was 22. Um, this is a little girl who uh, I've, I've told this story. I don't know if I've told any of the guys this story, but this, this little girl back in uh, 1994, uh, she was a few days old and mom was probably sleeping and I had Paige on the couch. She was our first and she, uh, she and I locked eyes. We were watching each other for, I don't know, how long, quite a while. And, uh, long story short, this little girl taught me about love and, uh, and she and I were, uh, we butted heads a lot because we were a lot alike, but, uh, uh, the two of us had a, had a really strong connection and um, she's got a brother two years younger who is a just a fantastic fantastic kid but uh, Paige was <clears throat> diagnosed at age nine in uh, 2004 with a uh, neurological progressive disorder called Friedrich's ataxia and that uh, it has no treatment there's no cure for it. Um, 
and uh, that's still the case. And uh, that rocked our world the first time. And uh, my wife and I became real, I mean, we've always had a great relationship, but we became, uh, we started mourning really the future that we dreamed for Paige wouldn't happen. Um, and, uh, you know, um, we had uh, 13 years of, of uh, taking care of and worrying about uh, our child. Um, who was fiercely independent and achieved a lot. Um, went to college on her own, lived on her own. Um, she actually uh, she actually died after her first day of graduate school in her own apartment. Total surprise. We weren't expecting. Uh, she was in supposedly good health, um, but uh, fell out of her wheelchair, and uh, I think she had a, a cardiac arrest trying to get up. But uh, I, uh, so, so I, I'm coming at this from a little different angle, maybe than Mike and Jeff, uh, Mike and, and Andy. Um, yeah, I certainly felt the, you know, I felt the frustration and the, the anger not being able to really like protect my child. Um, but uh, the vulnerability that dealing with a, uh, dealing with a diagnosis of your child and, and living with it for a long time and seeing her abilities, her physical abilities um, degrade over the course of more than a decade, um, that, that instills a vulnerability um, that maybe a lot of other guys don't, <laughs> don't have a chance um, to develop. Um, I also did a lot of small group um, facilitation for many years um, before and after um, Paige's diagnosis. So I'm, uh, I'm more comfortable maybe than a lot of guys uh, speaking about this kind of stuff in groups. But this, uh, this group um, with these guys, I, I, I was around pretty early when we, we met like every other week because we didn't have enough guys willing to show up every week. Um, we were usually in the single digits and, um, you know, Mike has really, uh, Mike has really stuck it out and, uh, and we built something pretty cool. Um, there are, uh, there are weeks when I'm going through some, some tough times and maybe I don't say much, but, uh, you know, there's other weeks when I feel, uh, feel pretty good about sharing what I've learned over the last four years with, with some of the other guys, we have uh, we have some amazing amazing stories. Um, if uh, I know my wife, my wife hops on a lot of the HPH um, Zoom calls, where you know you've got dozens, maybe a hundred or more people uh, sometimes. And I, I, you know, I don't generally go on those because I've got so much other stuff going on. Um, I watched a lot of them with her before I got involved with HFH, but um, uh, the HFH experience, I think, is more, it can be more intense and more healing. Um, there are times when we get off the call and I, you know, it's like, all right, I really should, uh, really should go to bed because I've got to get up early in the morning, but I just can't. I've got to unwind for a while sometimes um, because, uh, you know, um, there are, there are guys that come on that share some really powerful stories. Um, and, uh, you know, for a, for a zoom group, again, with my 15 years or so of, of, of small group facilitation, um, that I've done, um, this is a group of guys that just see each other on a computer screen every week and, uh, the level of sharing, um, and the level of, uh, kind of shared Shared empathy, shared compassion is uh, is just tremendous. I've never seen anything like it. So, you know, I know uh, if, you're, <laughs> if you've got uh, husbands or brothers or, uh, or or dads or or whatever out there that uh, that could benefit from a place to either just to just feel like they belong, um, 
you know, the stories are, are pretty varied and, and there's room for everybody. So I can't, uh, can't recommend it enough. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I was gonna throw in, um, um, you know, one of the things too, um, if there are any spouses here who have husbands um, who uh, resist talking about this stuff, the Helping Fathers Heal page and meetings, it, it's completely, it's completely confidential. And, you know, we put like a lot of emphasis on that. I mean, Irene and Elizabeth, I mean, we don't have a single female, you know, that has access to anything. So, um, and, and what I do is <clears throat> when, when, when I get a new dad, I'll pick his brain so that I can add him to the database. And even the database is confidential. And uh, when the meeting invitations go out, for example, it, it's all blind copied. So nobody has any email addresses or anything. And they're welcome to share them amongst each other, but I'm not going to give them to anybody. So uh, I, I just think that's a point that's worth throwing out there. Um, the other thing is like, going back to the difference between men and women and how they grieve. Um, I'll tell you what, in the early days, I think my wife and I really struggled. I mean, we're now 33 years married, uh, but we really struggled with the fact that we weren't at the same place on the grief timeline. And I think that's a really big deal. And I think it's a really big deal for people to understand and to accept that your spouse is not going to necessarily be at the same place in the grief timeline as you are. And once we sort of, you know, once the light bulb came on and we went, oh, that's what's going on because you're female, I'm male, whatever, um, then it got a lot easier, you know, because I was like, you know, <clears throat> I'm a very impatient person. And I was doing this uh, research, you know, intellectualizing grief, all that kind of stuff. And my wife was more about just sort of taking it in, you know, and just kind of experiencing the grief. And I didn't want to do that. So I, 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 def I, um, I deflected by doing that, you know. So once I think once she realized that I cared just as much, but in a different way or expressed it in a different way, um, I think we came back together. And, and the, the second thing is uh, communication. You know, we, we had to, to talk. We had to communicate or we wouldn't be together. And um, <clears throat> like, for example, Irene, I don't know if you know this, but uh, loss of a child is like uh, the number three reason for divorce. So you've got infidelity and you've got um, and, uh, financial, and then you got loss of a child. And I think the biggest reason over the last couple of years, what I've learned is I think the biggest reason that that is that way is lack of communication. That's a huge thing. You have got to sit down with your spouse and you've got to take time to, to uh, bear your soul. Men don't bear souls. That's the problem. We suck at grief. We absolutely suck at grief. And it takes time for us to figure out how to, to allow ourselves. And, and well, number one, not to allow ourselves, but to, um, to give ourselves permission to become vulnerable. Because men don't want to be vulnerable. You know, and, and, and again, I'm using myself as an example. I mean, I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to be told what to do. I want to understand everything that's going on around me. I mean, I, I, I want to know everything. I want to understand everything. Otherwise, I doubt it, you know. So <clears throat> allowing myself to finally become vulnerable was a big game changer for our relationship. 
and I'm not going into relationships and I don't mean to sound like that, but I'm just saying for anybody here who's got a spouse that you're struggling with or any of that, you know, the best thing you can do is sit them down look them right in the eye and just say, how are you feeling today? I'm doing a check-in. I want to check in on you and see how you're doing. And you'd be amazed at how they melt. And then they ask you, how are you doing? And then you can be honest and you can tell them, you know, it's, it's vulnerability that men struggle with, you know, it's power, power, control, uh, the fact that men, you know, always feel like, you know, we have to understand everything that's going on around us, especially a geophysicist. <laughs> I've got this analytical brain, but it's also, it's this vulnerability, you know, it's like, you've got to be able to have humility and vulnerability and acceptance. Or it's, you know, I mean, to me, that was my key was acceptance, you know. But uh, I just just wanted to add something, Mike, because I did some research myself about marriages and um, what happens. And um, they did take that study a little bit further and found that the marriages that did fall apart were not in a good place. Most of them before before. people experienced a tragedy. And right. that was, you know, maybe people were just coasting and they're peacefully coexisting and, yeah. you know, getting along and whatever. And then tragedy happens and that just, you know, precipitates yeah. the, that, the final blow, so to speak. No, that's a, yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely a great point. Mm. So if you haven't been communicating before, then uh, maybe you ought to start real fast. <laughs> that's yes. a good point, though, Irene. Yeah, if you're on rocky grounds, you know, and then something like this happens. I mean, this is, you know, the other thing is people, people don't really like to label the loss of a child, but, you know, it's a trauma. And, and I mean, it's so the way we, we, we always joke, joke around here about, you know, is it a major or a mid or a minor trauma, you know, event, you know, like our dog and, you know, she, she fell down or something, you know? So, but <clears throat> this is nothing gets, nothing's bigger than this. This is a major, super major trauma, you know? And, uh, you know, PTSD and all that kind of stuff, that's all normal, you know? Especially in the first year. And, but, you know, you, you also have to, even if, even if it doesn't hit you that, that way, it may, hit your spouse that way. So you really got to be uh, very um, sensitive and, and uh, you know, caring. Yeah, well, I totally agree with you in that. And I believe that the trauma work that I've done is as important as the spiritual work. Yeah. Because I believe that every parent that has experienced the loss of a child has experienced PTSD. Yeah. You know, it's that shock. Absolutely. I mean, how could it not be, you know, unless, unless you're trying to intellectualize it by reading a bunch of books like I did. But what I figured out was that uh, after about two and a half years, it smacked me in the face because what I'd done is I, I had deflected. Right. And after two and a half years, all of a sudden, one day I was in the car and I just started bawling. I mean, I just started bawling, man. I had to pull off. It was that bad. And I'm like, what is that? That's not me. I don't do that because I'm a guy, you know? And, uh, but I figured out, you know, that that's what happened. You know, I'd been, I had it all bottled up. And that's what guys do. Guys bottle this stuff up, you know? And that's why we die before the, the ladies do, generally. You know, because we're carrying around all this stuff, you know, and we're not, you know, we were raised not to allow that stuff to come out and be expressed or to be shown. And that's all about the vulnerability. So <clears throat> where I'm going with that is that's what Helping Fathers Heal is all about. You can come in there, you know, you can live your normal life and you can be stoic and, and you can be tough and you can be a guy, but you can come to Helping Fathers Heal and you can let it out. And like Chris was saying, I mean, we've had some really 
big time serious stories in there, like amazing stories, like, oh, you know, and we've had people that have broken down and start crying and, you know, it's prop. I don't, it, maybe it was the first time they, they ever cried in their lives. I don't know, you know, uh, much less with a, a group of guys, you know, but I think it's a comfortable enough environment to where, you know, people feel like they can do that and not be embarrassed or, you know, the big thing is that it's not a mixed crowd. You know, <clears throat> that grief meeting that, that Allison and I used to go to, I mean, it didn't take me very long to figure out why it was 45 women and five guys. It's because it was a mixed group, right? And, and I'm sitting there and it comes my turn to share. Well, shit, man, I'm not, I'm not going to sit there and like, you know, put my heart out there and, and, you know, get all vulnerable with all these women around me. Right. So that's what, uh, that was the impetus for this, this group being formed and Elizabeth and, uh, and Irene, you know, like sort of gave me the, the tools and the avenue to, to put it together. And it's not a pat on the back for me or anything like that. I'm just telling you guys, if you have a, if you have a spouse that's struggling with this stuff, the other thing I do is I offer, I offer to every new guy, if, if they need to have a one-on-one -on -one zoom, yeah, especially the new guys, the, the really new guys, which, you know, in a, I've been told they really help. Um, then I offer those. Okay. Of course, no charge, whatever, you know, this is all, but, but I mean, I've, I've had one-on-one -on -one zoom meetings that lasted three hours with a guy in India, for example, and a couple of hours with a guy down in Peru, you know, in Santiago, Chile, and, and, uh, much, you know, much less Atlanta, Georgia, and, you know, Phoenix. So, um, if you've got, if you've got somebody like that, who's struggling or who's, who's really got a wall that, you know, they can't break through, uh, just tell them, look, this guy, man, he's, he's really cool. He's really nice. And, you know, he's got a good sense of humor and crap like that, you know, and, uh, all you gotta do is get a hold of me and I'll, I'll gladly have a one-on-one -on -one with them. And there's, you know, there's no obligation. They could just like go, oh, I didn't like it, you know? So I didn't like the guy or whatever, you know? But at least it, it cracks the door open a little bit, you know? Yeah. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, I, I agree. And um, for those of you who aren't following the chat, uh, Doug, if you will allow me to call you out. You know, I think one of the neat things about our group is uh, and Mike, you can confirm this. We've had a lot of dads that come on and uh, just basically are in the background for weeks yeah. or months yeah. before they begin to share. They, they just, they're there, they're sitting quietly, they're listening to the other dads share their stories and share their, their pain, share their successes, what's, what's been working for them on the healing side. Uh, and Doug, I think you alluded to that in the chat. Would you be willing to, to share your story with the group? Um, sure. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, so uh, my youngest daughter, Brittany, passed away a little over two and a half years ago uh, from cancer. And uh, it, uh, it just ripped the family apart. Um, there was no communication. Um, my marriage didn't survive, um, and um, I actually found out about helping parents heal first. I read Sus Suzanne Giesman's book, Still Right Here, and that's how I found uh, HPH, and I think one of the moms from HPH uh, replied to a post of mine that there's a group for men exclusively for men. And so um, I thought, well, I'll check it out. I, th I think I joined the group. Um, it's been probably eight or nine, maybe 10 months ago. And for the first 
I don't know, seven or eight months, I, I didn't really have the courage to, you know, to, to participate in the Zoom meetings, but I watched in the background, I watched all the recordings. Uh, Mike always records the sessions and uh, it's a bunch of guys that uh, don't hold back and they share their feelings in it. And, you know, it's okay to be vulnerable. And uh, that really impressed me. So uh, I had a out of state relocation that kept me away for uh, about a month, but I just recently started attending the Zoom calls again, the, the Helping Fathers Heal Zoom calls. And uh, I have the the highest regard for all of the guys and Mike on the calls. Uh, it's it's just amazing. And uh, occasionally Mike will get speakers, um, kind of like uh, HPH does. So that's that's a plus too. So, uh, but yeah, I highly encourage uh, spouses, brothers, who, whoever, uh, to to look at this group. And uh, you know, if if they're not ready to participate, just watch in the background, like Mike says, he, he encourages that and that's okay. And that's what I did. But um, I found the group very sincere and, and compassionate. All the guys in the group are that way. So. Thank you, Doug. Um, the other thing I was going to say that I forgot to say uh, at the very beginning was it wasn't it, when I went to the, when I went to this other grief group, it wasn't, just the fact that there were five out of 50 that were men. It was also the fact that, you know, <clears throat> people just every, every month, they just kept replaying the tapes of the day they lost their child. You know, there was no, it wasn't solution oriented at all, like zero. And there was no discussion about afterlife. And that was what I was after. And um, in fact, it was off limits, and which kind of pissed me off. But, <clears throat> you know, so I wanted, to, I wanted to have like a solution oriented, you know, and when I started that website um, that never really kicked off because I got into helping parents heal before that, but, you know, I didn't know where that was going, you know, like, okay, I want it to be solution oriented, but what does that look like, you know, and helping parents heal actually, you know, told me how it needed to look because the guys that are in our group, you know, they don't have a problem with talking about afterlife. I've had a few who've come in and they go, okay, you know, I've got religious convictions and, and stuff like that, which I don't have a problem with at all. I have zero problem with that. And they've left and that's cool, you know, but we're very upfront about it. And that's what I like too about it. Um, I like the fact that helping parents heal and helping fathers heal is very upfront about the fact that we do talk about afterlife and we, we invite discussions about afterlife evidence and uh, signs and, and all that stuff, you know? So um, that's a big differentiator. You know, that's a, that's a huge differentiator. I mean, really enormous. Uh, it was a game changer for me. So um, anyway, <clears throat> that's wonderful thank you yeah i mean that makes all the difference in the world our children yeah. still exist they're just in a different form and we'll always be their parents and um you know we'll see them again in the blink of an eye and i yeah. really want to invite and encourage all the dads that are on here so i know some of you are registered for the conference to come to the conference um, I've been to many conferences and usually after life conferences there aren't many men but at the first conference i think Jeff, we were about 30%, you know, there, men, which yeah, is, there, there were, which is there were a lot. Of. It was, it was really refreshing to see that there were, and, and to be honest, um, in, in talking with some that I did, it's very clear that a lot of them were, were brought kicking and screaming <laughs> and they, and that reflected pretty, pretty openly the first day by the end of the day, or by the end of the conference, I think to a person, they were all thrilled to have had the opportunity to, to share that experience and be exposed to the, the types of speakers and the lessons and the, and the experiences that everyone had shared. And, and you know, Mike, you were there, uh, you know. Fantastic. I, I, I go back, 
I go back to the banquet on Saturday night. And when you hear, uh, we had 350 people in the dining room, Irene, is that right? Or 400? Almost, almost 500, yeah. Almost 500. I mean, it was, it was packed. And the noise level was staggering. And, and just looking around the room, you saw people sharing their kids. They were probably sitting at the table with strangers. They were sharing their kids and they were sharing their stories. And there was, yeah. there was a lot of laughter. You know, was it, there, was, there were some people, I think that there, there were some people that signed on that I think had lost a child within, it was a matter of weeks, mm -hmm. not, not months or years. So it was clearly raw for a lot of people, but um, there was just, the energy in the room was palpable. And I guarantee you that nobody walking past one of the open doors could have guessed what it was that brought everyone together in that room. It was, it was magical. And we, uh, I believe Mike knows, if not, I'm putting him on the spot, but he'll be uh, <laughs> in charge with some of you other dads of a dad's panel, you know, a father's panel yeah. at the conference, men only. No women allowed through those doors. Nope. And uh, I, think yeah, I think that's that's in the bar, right, Mike? That's in the <laughs> yep. bar. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. do we have to do we have to bring our own jokes? No, uh, I'll have plenty. Okay. You you haven't really shared like one of the real <laughs> benefits of showing up for a helping fathers heal meeting, Mike. Well, I was gonna finish off the meeting. Or or Chris, like your biggest fan. I think Chris is your biggest <laughs> fan on that the last five minutes of the meeting. Oh, I am the biggest fan, yeah. <laughs> and Chris's eyeballs go white. <laughs> you know, I, I, gotta, I gotta pile on, on on something you just said, Jeff, and, and Ann and I are coming, we were already signed up and booked and everything um, to the conference next August. Um, but you, you mentioned something about, about the, the room being full of people sharing their kids and all. And I, it makes me think about uh, going back to, to my daughter, we used to go to uh, uh, symposia uh, once a year to hear about the latest research and everything into the, the, the disorder that she had. And, uh, and in that room, there were people, uh, there were parents and caregivers and doctors, as well as people suffering from the disease. And you got to see what happens to people over time. So the first couple of times we went, it was very sobering because you got to see how bad it could get. What I hear you saying is people come to this conference, maybe if they're early in the journey, can see how good it can get. How yeah. healing. Well, can be. very well said. That that, uh, that just resonated with me. So I mean the goal, the goal that we're an all example at. of the vulnerability, ladies. So Tell your husbands, show up. <laughs> the goal that we're all after, though, is <clears throat> is to have a guy join the group and help him to get in a better place as soon as possible. And, <clears throat> you know, I didn't have that. So it took me, you know, two and a half years or whatever. And so I was mired in, in grief and staring at walls and watching Netflix and, you know, for all that all that time if I wasn't at work. So, I mean, I think everybody in our group gets it. And that's kind of what we're all after is to help each other get, you know, further along, not over it, none of that, you know, BS, but just further along in, in the healing process as soon as possible, you know, because I mean, <clears throat> you can either, you can either be, you know, at that point now, or you can be that at that point, you know, two years from now. So... You know, I don't think our kids, that's not what our kids want. You know, our, our kids want us to, to, uh, to get there as soon as possible. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, I was, I know we're running out of time, Irene, but I just wanted okay. to say, say real quick, um, uh, you know, <clears throat> and the guys here that know me and have been with me for a long time, know uh, they've heard this a million times, but, I just want to tell everybody, there's a couple of things that I have definitely learned over the last, you know, four and a half, five, almost five years. Number one, there's no rules to grief. Okay. There are no rules to grief. There are no timelines or rules to grief. 
And you got to be aware and you got to be sensitive to the fact that your spouse, if you have a spouse, your spouse is probably almost, almost assuredly not on the same place on the uh, grief timeline. Okay. The other thing that, uh, as far as men go, is that what I've learned <clears throat> in the last four and a half years is that, and, and accept it, that's the important bit. It's not that I've learned it, but I've accepted it in my heart is that I don't have to understand everything. You know, I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to understand why my son passed at 24. You know, what I believe now is that things happen the way they're supposed to happen. You know, I, I hate that saying, you know, everything happens for a reason. So I, I've kind of reworded it, but I do believe that everything happens the way it's supposed to happen, you know? So, and I don't have to understand it, you know? It, it, that's a huge weight off my shoulders to not have to sit around and figure out, well, how come that happened, you know? Because that then all the anger and the resentments and all that stuff just kind of dissipates, you know? So I just wanted to share those, those two things with you. Sure. That's beautiful. Thank you, Mike. And you know, last week, Gordon Smith spoke and um, he said something and I, I, I wrote it down. I have it on my computer. He said to understand is to just stand under knowledge. And I just thought that was so profound yeah. and really cool. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah. Good. Yep. Okay. Well, listen, um, Irene, I guess we're out of time. Uh, does anybody else have any questions you want to ask before we Anybody just raise your hand, unmute yourself if you'd like to say something yeah. or ask I'm not a question. Agreeing, you know, if you yeah. guys, so if you've got yeah. anything. Yeah, we're fine. Okay. Okay. Well, listen, Irene, um, like Chris was saying, you know, we always, the thing about, and this is the other thing that you can entice your spouse with. At the end of every Help and Fathers Heal meeting, we wrap it up. You know, we've been through an hour and a half of really deep stuff, right? And so we always end up with like what we call a dad joke. Okay. Andy, we were so close. I know. We were so close. <laughs> we almost made it. <laughs> but that's why they're called dad jokes, right? <laughs> so I went to a beekeeper uh, to buy a dozen bees, right? She packed 13 in a container and handed it to me. When I pointed out there was a 13th bee in there, she said, it's a freebie. <laughs> that's just a, that's a sample. Okay. That's a sample. Just a teaser. It's a teaser. <laughs> hey, you're, you're going to be here tomorrow night, right, Mike? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> yes, that's right. There is a, a Helping Fathers Heal meeting every Wednesday evening, every Wednesday. Um, 8 p.m. Eastern time. And I think you said it's a 90 minute meeting. Yeah. Uh, I encourage hard. Eight all of you, yes, that are on here to please invite your spouses to join. I tell all the moms in my meetings, tell your husbands to join. They don't have to turn their computer uh, video on. They can stay muted, but right. just join in and be a part of it. And I do that with my chats as well. And eventually people do turn their video on and then they do speak. So um, oh, oh, thank you. One other point, Irene, is that, um, you know, I, a lot of uh, guys, especially around my age, hate Facebook. You know, they will not do a Facebook page. And you don't have to be a Facebook member of our group to attend the Wednesday meetings. The only thing I need is their email address because I also send out um, meeting invitations with the same uh, details, the link and all that stuff, you know, but I can't do anything without an email address, so. But it's not, a, it's not a prerequisite. It's not a requirement to be, uh, you know, part of the Facebook group. Uh, although I recommend it because then you can post and, and see posts and, and that, you know. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you, Jeff and Andy, John, Chris, Doug, Warren. It was nice to, nice to see you, Warren. Um, we've interacted on Facebook. Jeff and uh, Augusto that I know is here. Thank you all for, for showing up and for doing oh, what you do not, to help dads. Irene, hang on, mm -hmm. hang, hang on. Yep. 
I got another one for Chris. <laughs> Apparently, you can't use beef stew as a password. It's not strong enough. <laughs> All right. No problem getting to sleep tonight. <laughs> well, Come thank on. you. Thanks for hosting, Irene. Appreciate it. Oh, uh, thank you for doing this, it. all of you. It. Yes. Thank it's thanks, nice Irene. to see all everybody. Right. Please, un please unmute and say goodnight and goodbye and uh, see thank everybody you. soon. <laughs>